all of you watching by the internet today. Hey, I want you to grab your notes out of your worship guide for today's message. I'm excited about this series uh, because we are entering the Easter season. And if you know anything about uh, the Easter season for Cultivate, those of you who have been around for any length of time, it's a big season for us. We think Easter of like the Super Bowl of Sundays. And here's the cool part about it is we treat it that way because your friends, your family, people that you know that would not go to church any other time of the year will go to church on Easter. Now, I've always tried to figure this out. I don't know if it's because we live in the South and it's tradition. I don't know what this is, but ladies, I think I've got you figured out, okay? It's because you say, if I'm going to go to church on Easter, I have to have something new to wear. So you will treat it as a shopping experience just so that you can go and get something new. So hey, if I have to show up to church once a year, but I get to shop for it, I'm all in. And then guys, you know, if she's going to church, she says, you're going with us. It's one day a year. Get up, get ready, and go. So we take advantage of the Easter season. And so you saw a lot of things on the screens that's happening this month. It's a crazy month around here, but it is a ton of fun every year. So I encourage you now, start inviting for Easter. Next week, we'll have some resources for you, some cards and some invites that you can hand out to your friends and people that you work with so that you can begin inviting. Did you know that 80% of people will say yes to an invitation to church if only we would ask? That's 8 out of 10 people that you ask will actually show up uh, if we just invite them to come. So it's going to be real exciting, so go ahead and know we're just a few weeks away from Easter, and that means a lot of stuff happening. You saw that we're going to stuff uh, Easter eggs right here at Columbiana Campus, 10,000 Easter eggs. Listen, we're like an Easter-making machine at Cultivate Church, okay? We got assembly lines lined up. It's like a sweatshop in here. We lock ourselves in with tables full of candy and plastic eggs, and here's what we do. We take these plastic eggs, and we fill these with candy, and with the church, is, this is part of your, your generosity as a church that we're able to do this, and we will stuff these eggs. We will tape them up tight because all of the eggs that you stuff will be dropped from a helicopter for thousands and thousands of kids to receive uh, at our helicopter egg drop. So go ahead and make plans to be a part of both of those, and if you want to serve at the egg drop, I mean, there's tons of stuff to do. That day is bananas. It is just a ton of fun. Uh, so put it on your connect card that you want to serve and put down your t-shirt size because we're going to give you a t-shirt for being a part of that day and for serving that you can wear at the egg drop, and there's something for everybody to do. And then those of you who have kids and you go, well, what about my kids? Uh, you know, it, obviously, you, you bring your kids. They're going to have a blast. They're going to have an entire uh, day full of fun, and there's going to be uh, inflatables and free food, and there's going to be the Easter bunny. Going to get some, take some pictures with the Easter bunny, and then the egg drops and all that good stuff. But here's the heart of our church. Our heart is always, it's not about, hey, this is an event we're throwing for us, uh, because this is an event we're throwing for our county. This is for us to show the love of Jesus through generosity. So bring your kids. We, we're teaching our, small, our son, even though he's small, that, hey, we do everything we do to bless other people, and we get to be a part of the fun along the journey. So go ahead and just mark it uh, to be a part of that day. But today, on your outline, I want to give you our key verse of Scripture for this month as we go into this series, Walking Billboard. It says, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. So obviously that's speaking to us as believers, those of us who have given our heart and our life to Jesus. We know that we're to worship the Lord. He should be number one in our life. And then there's another responsibility that we carry, and this responsibility is what we're going to focus in on this month, is that if someone asks you about the hope you have as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And I don't know about you, but there's times in my life where that freaks me out, okay? Because in church, you know, this is a safe environment, right? This is a safe place. If you uh, love the Lord, this is a safe place to be because most of us, we all in here, we all love the Lord. And then if you show up in church and you don't have a relationship with Jesus or understand what's going on inside the church, well, it's kind of easy to follow along. You just clap with everybody else, sing a song that's on the screen, and sit down when everybody else sits. You can blend in. It's okay, right? But when we get out into the wild, right, when you go to work, when you're on your job, when you are sitting in the line at the grocery store and somebody says, hey, why do you go to that Cultivate Church? Are they a cult over there? You know, we kind of get that Cultivate, not a cult. So just, you know, that's how rumors get started. But if you're standing there and somebody wants to know, why do you do that? Why do you say you follow Jesus? What is this all about? Why is this personal for you? It's at that moment that you have to be able to put your faith and your decision in Jesus into words. You have to be able to explain to somebody why it is that you have hope in Jesus. And I don't know why that is so scary for many of us, but it is. Because we're afraid we're going to not say the right thing. We're afraid we're going to
going to say something wrong. We're going to afraid we're going to offend somebody. What if they ask me a question about the Bible that I don't know? Like we just rather not say anything so that we don't get uh, any sort of opportunity to embarrass ourselves, right? But here's the deal. The Bible says it's our responsibility to give a reason for the hope that we have. Listen, Cultivate Church over the past six years, has seen so many people give their heart to Jesus. Just this year, 40 people alone have already said yes to Jesus. And this is why it's happening. It's because of you and your story and your heart to share what God's done in your life. Hear me give you a reality check. Nobody cares about who the pastor is. Nobody cares about what the message was on Sunday. They just don't. Your friends that don't attend church, that does not impress them one bit. Here's what they want to know. Why do you believe it? Why do you you give your heart to Jesus, why is important to you? And when you can share the reason for the hope that you have, that's going to speak life and volumes to the people who are around you because they're invested in you. So this series, Walking Billboard, is simply how can we become a walking billboard for the story or the hope, the life that we found in Jesus. And if you don't understand that term, maybe you've heard it before, but what is a walking billboard? All of us, whether you know it or not, are walking billboards for lots of different things. Uh, if you were wearing tennis shoes this morning of some sort, I would say that if you look down, you probably have some sort of giant logo on your shoe. There is something branded to your shoe. I was thinking immediately back in the 90s. Can you guys remember some of the fashion trends of the 90s? Come on, Tommy Hilfiger. Come on, baby. If you didn't know who Tommy Hilfiger was, you weren't alive and wearing, you were naked in the 90s, right? Tommy Hilfiger with the big red and white. It was all over their clothes. You couldn't wear a shirt that had Tommy Hilfiger that somebody didn't know what it was. Why? Because they branded all over. There was something about the 90s that brands were just all over the clothes that you wore. Uh, if you drive a Mercedes or if you've seen a Mercedes, I, I love uh, nice cars, whatever, but listen, I love that big Mercedes logo. Like It's either big on the hood or like big in the grill, they know you're driving a Mercedes. You know why? Because you became a walking billboard for that brand. Your clothes that you wear, the, the, the cars that you drive, everything around us is a walking billboard. I think Yeti is like masters at this. Come on, we're wearing Yeti hats and Yeti shirts, and they're like cups and coolers. Like, like why are we, like, I got my Yeti cap on, like, you know, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a cooler. Like, I mean, how did that become a fashion trend when it's a cooler? But you know what? Yeti is excited about it because everywhere we walk, we're saying, buy an expensive cup, buy an expensive cooler. Yeti. You know what I'm saying? Like, we are walking billboards. All of us, we just live this out in everyday life, sometimes without even knowing it. But what if we became intentional and we lived our life on purpose? What a concept. What if every day that I got up, I decided that I'm going to live my life on purpose and that my life would become a walking billboard for Jesus and for what he's done in my life? So this morning, I want us just to go into a few things and learn about ourselves, some areas about ourselves, and then how we can become walking billboards to those who are around us. But I want to pray over the word that God would speak to us today and he would use it uh, to speak into our lives. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we love you. We thank you for, God, your presence this morning, that we got to worship you and just be encouraged by uh, the presence that's in this room. And Father, we pray that in this message today that you would just challenge us, maybe convict us, God, of the faith that we're living out. God, we understand that we have a great responsibility to share with those around us. God, if we believe that eternity is real and that there is a heaven and that there is a hell, what a responsibility we share to spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus to those around us. So today, I just pray that you motivate us and you encourage us, that we would learn to take advantage of this season of time, God, to make a difference in the lives of people, God, through sharing our story and becoming walking billboards. In Jesus' name, amen. So on your outline, I want you to write down a few things, and this is some information about yourself. This is how you can get to know who you are to begin to develop your story. There's three parts of us. And the first one is this, it's the me we see. 
Okay, this is the me that we see. This is the public perception of you. This is what you want everyone else to know about you. This is what you put on social media. Okay, I love to watch my wife take social media pictures. If you look at her picture roll, there's like 50 pictures of the one that made it to Instagram. Right? The lighting's got to be right. The angle's got to be right. I mean, all of these things, ladies, that you're looking for. I'm not quite sure what it is that you're looking for in all the pictures that you take. I don't know what angle is just perfect or right. Some of you say you have a good side and you have a bad side. Um, some of you think that the only side is like filter side, right? Aren't you glad? Like those filters, you look at them and you go, hey, fellas, let me, single folks, let me tell you, don't judge by social media. It's a lie, okay? None of those pictures are real. But we've got this image of ourselves that we want other people to see. It's the good side of us that we want everyone to know about. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks of it, Luke 12 and 8. He says, I tell you the truth, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. There's something about the power of things being in the open, being transparent. There's something about putting yourself out there that we get reserved, that we're afraid that people see something that they don't like. We're afraid that we'll look wrong or we'll appear wrong or that we'll act wrong or that we'll say something wrong. We have this fear of opening ourselves up. So oftentimes when we walk into public, we've got this uh, kind of this facade up. I love the church world because, listen, I don't tell people in public... I like to say it out in the wild. I don't tell people that I'm a pastor because I'll be having a conversation with somebody. And I mean, you know, depending on where you are, you know, everybody talks a little different, has a little different topics they talk about. Sometimes there's colorful language that's going around, you know, and maybe sometimes there's crude jokes, you know, that's happening in the conversation. And then when somebody walks in, middle of all this happening goes, hey, pastor, good to see you. Everybody's eyes light up real big. And they go, you know what? I didn't mean to talk that way. You know what? I need you to pray for me. Listen, could you, t could you pray for my wife? We're really struggling with some issues in our life, and I'm really trying to be better. And I'm like, hey, listen, I, I tried not to let you know I was the pastor. Like, it's okay. Don't treat me different because of who I am. I want you to be you. So in other words, don't worry about letting yourself be yourself. Because the reality is, anything that is public, people already know, okay? So what the problem is, when we walk in church sometimes, we walk in here and you have beat your kids on the ride to church. You and your spouse have almost divorced before you got here. But as soon as you hit those doors and you see somebody with that green tag that says good morning, you say, well, good morning and praise the Lord. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, brother. Good morning, sister. Praise the Lord, everybody. And that's how we walk into church. Listen, I already know that you've had to ask forgiveness 10 times before you got in this building, okay? Listen, don't put on a front. The reality is it's discovering who we are as people and finding a relationship with Jesus so that we can live it out in that public persona. It's okay. And then, number two, we have the me that I see. The me that I see, and this is where it gets real. I love this. This is you at the house with no makeup, your hair's all crazy, and you're in your sweatpants with holes and rips in it, and the shirt that your kids have thrown up all over, and this is you on the couch watching TV. Like, this is the one that if somebody came at you with a camera, you would go like Rambo on them. Like, it would get bad. Don't put that camera in my face, because I don't want anyone to see this. This is the struggles that we face. I want to just kind of let you know today and relieve a little pressure off your shoulders is that nobody in this room is perfect. And I know that blows your mind. I know that that blows your whole concept of life. But nobody in this room is perfect. No one's family is perfect. Remember that me, that I want everyone to see the public. Listen, you think that family is perfect on, uh, on Instagram? Listen, I have people come to me and say, your baby is so good. Like, he is perfect. And I look at them like, what language are you speaking? No, he's not. But he looks so cool on Instagram. Well, of course, because if I post everything else, you'll think I'm killing him, okay? I had to take that one moment and capture it. And just I just want the world to know I had a good moment today. This was it right here. Share it with me. Listen, none of us in this room are perfect. Everyone gets it wrong. Everyone makes mistakes. 
But the reality is this is the place where our character is developed and our integrity is developed. This is the area of our life where God can really begin to work on us from the inside out, where God can begin to transform our life from here so that when we begin to express it here, everyone can see what Jesus is doing in our life. The Bible says this, I know that nothing good lives in me. This is Paul speaking. He said, that is my sinful nature. We have a sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't do, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Here's the reality of this. Unless Jesus becomes number one and has full control of my life, I will never be able to overcome on my own. I cannot do it on my own. So there are some of us in this room that we have walked in this place or watching by the internet and you have this inward struggle where you're saying, I so desperately want to be a man of God. I so desperately want to be a woman of God. I so desperately want to love God with everything in me. And I want people to know who Jesus is, but I don't feel like my life can be a walking billboard for Jesus because of the me that I see. You have to come to Jesus and say, God, I can't, but you can. I don't have the ability, but you are stronger, you are bigger. I can do all things because of Jesus living in me. Life change begins with the power of Jesus working in your life. So automatically just know this, that the Bible, they, they understood it. The Bible gives us a picture of it, and Jesus understands the struggle that you and I face because of sin in our lives. And then the last one that I'll talk to you about is the me that you see. The me that you see. Listen to what the Bible says. This is, in, this is incredible. Philip went to look for Nathaniel. So he's, this guy's going to look for his buddy, and he's got some news for him. He says, we found the very person Moses, the prophet, wrote about. His name is Jesus. He said, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And then check this out. Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? So you got Philip going to his buddy Nathaniel. He says, listen, you're not going to believe this. I found Jesus that was, that was prophesied about long ago. The son of God is here, and I found him. As a matter of fact, he's Joseph's boy. Turns out Joseph's son, Jesus, is the son of God, the one from Nazareth. And then Nathaniel speaks up and goes, wait a second, from that town? What good could come from that town? How, it's like saying, hey guys, we found Jesus. He's from Shelby, <laughs> right? He, he lives, remember, Joseph's boy out on the lake out in Shelby. And then you go, come on, really? <laughs> Wait a second. You mean to tell me that God, the, 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 the creator of the world, Planted his son in Shelby County, Alabama. Like of all the places, that's where the Savior comes from. Does anything good come from Shelby? Listen, I was raised in Bradford, Alabama. You ever heard of that? No, you haven't, okay? So can anything good? Surely Jesus didn't come from Bradford, Alabama. So here's what they were saying. On what they could perceive, what they saw on the outside, they said, can anything good come from there? Many of us in this room, you're afraid of what people have, have observed in your life because of decisions that you've made or maybe things that have happened to you in your life, things in your control or out of your control, experiences that you've walked through. You're afraid that somebody's going to look at you if you express Jesus in your life and what God has done, that people are going to look at you and say, there is no way because I know who you used to be. I know who you are at home. Come on, everybody. That's the hardest place to be a, a Christ-like person is at home. You've done so good until you get back in the car after church and suddenly the devil is back in the car you know <laughs> praise God what a beautiful day you better shut up I'm gonna come back there you know what I'm saying <laughs> and then you go how can I ever be Jesus to my family because I don't know how to act in front of my family we get so afraid about all of these things and we get insecure and here's what I'm telling us today there's all of these sides to who we are and if we let the enemy paralyze us in fear 
And if we let the enemy tell us that you're not good enough and that you can't overcome and because you're sinful and because you've got shortcomings and because you've got failures and because you don't get it right all the time, you can't make a difference to people who are around you. But I'm here to tell you this morning that because of Jesus, every one of us have a story. We have something to share. You've experienced God. And if you haven't, open your heart to him and see what he can do for your life. You've got something valuable to share with those who are around you. The greatest thing that you could ever do is be a walking billboard and share your story with others. So how do we do this? I want you to flip your outline over and I want to give you three ways just to let people know about the goodness of God in your life. Very simple. The first one is this. Write this down. Be real. Be real. Come on, that makes us uncomfortable because we live in a fake world. Everything is fake. Come on, you, you know, ladies, I, I, I'm picking on you today. I don't know why so much. My wife's not here. I guess I feel a little freedom. But, um, uh, you know, nothing's real. Come on. My wife, you, you guys see her up here. She's a dark-headed one sometimes, leading worship, playing guitar. She's not a dark-headed person. <laughs> She's a blonde. She's a natural Blonde. We will be married 10 years this year. I'm being real today because she's not here. I've only seen her as a blonde one time. It freaked me out. It freaked me out. Our son is like borderline blonde and red-headed. I look at him. He's pale skin. My wife, oh, she's dark skin. No, she's not. She's got a spray tan on. And so uh, I look at my son and I go, who do you belong to? I take him in public and people think we have stolen him, Okay. You got to be real. Let's be honest. Come on. We all make it. We get mistakes. We get problems. We get troubles. Your family's not perfect. And let me tell you what. Somebody out there that doesn't know Jesus looks at you. They are encouraged that your life is not perfect. Why do we suddenly feel like when we meet Jesus, we got to pretend like everything's good and everything is perfect and we make everyone else feel like failures because we've got it all together. we got the secret sauce. Listen, some days I just need Jesus to carry me if I'm going to be real because I can't do it on my own. So I need Jesus, and I can tell people, listen, it's only Jesus that makes this place work. It's only Jesus that keeps my life together. Learn to be real. Luke 3 and 8 says, prove by the way that you live that you've repented of your sins and that you've turned to God. Prove by the way that you live that you've repented of your sins and you've turned to God. Because there was a yesterday, and then because of Jesus, I have a new today. And because of Jesus, I will be better tomorrow than I am today. Every day a part of this journey with Jesus, he is making me better. And if I would just be real with people and open my life up without fear of what they're going to think of me and say, look at the power of Jesus working in my life, it will encourage people who are around me. Just be real. And the number two, this is great, be useful. Be useful. Come on, if, ask yourself this question. I want you to really think about this. I'm asking myself, how useful are you to Jesus? Think about that today. How useful, I mean, you ever, you ever seen somebody that was just useless? Come on, you work with some of those people. Like, is it, is it tough for you to breathe? Like you, know what I mean? like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're so lazy, I feel like it's tough for you to breathe. Like, I, I just feel sorry for you. You are useless, okay? Listen, some of you have pets, animals, you know, they, they, they don't bark, they don't do anything, they're literally useless. They won't let you pet them, like they're useless at that point. Be useful to the Lord. The Bible says, those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Listen, be useful. How can we be useful? Invite somebody to church. Come on, invite. Listen, this is the easiest place to go to church. If you can't go to church here, come on, you ain't going to make it nowhere, okay? This place is simply supposed to be an on-ramp to the interstate. Come on, if it's not for that on-ramp that you can get on and that you can guide yourself and pace yourself till you get to that fast track of people going. Listen, sometimes you get in the church world and you walk in the door and people just expect you to be on the interstate going. Save, sanctify, fill the Holy Spirit, ready to go. You know what I'm saying? Like right there in a the day. 
And you're still trying to figure out if these people are weird or not. Like you walk in the door. Listen, at this place, this is an on-ramp where you can get on that on-ramp and you can kind of see people loving God and living their life on purpose. And you can kind of feel your way in this. And then suddenly Jesus has changed your life. And before you know it, you're on the interstate and you're carrying people with you. But be useful. Invite somebody. Listen, social media, come on. Enough. Listen, I'm, I'm guilty. Enough with the baby pictures. Enough with the, you know, the, the animal pictures. Nobody cares about my baby like I do. I don't know why I feel the need to share him with you every day. But listen, use our social media. On Facebook, if you can like it, share it. Come on, if there's a message that speaks to your heart, the reason that we put it out there is not just for a like. We're not trying to build a Facebook page or a following for, for us. Listen, if you have been blessed by the Word of God and it will do your friends some good, if you can like it, share it. Share it to your friends so that it can, it can minister to them. If you think somebody can benefit from being at that egg drop, share it. Use the tools that we have. Come on, the disciples had to walk like barefooted in mud and dirt and for miles just to tell somebody Jesus loved them. We can put it on Facebook and send it across the world. World. They're looking at us today like, you guys are spoiled, rotten, and don't even know it. Share. Come on, use what we've got. Let's be, let's be useful. Let's lead a small group. Attend a small group. Why don't we do small groups? Listen, there's a small group around here that goes to lunch every week. Come on, right after this 1130 experience, they'll go to lunch and just eat together. Invite somebody. Your friends may not come to church, but they'll go eat some food if you'll buy it. Come on, be generous. <laughs> Invite them. So what small groups are for. Purchase somebody a meal this week. Let them out in traffic. Smile at somebody. Come on, Jesus loves me, but my face don't know it. Come on, let somebody know this week that God's done something in your life. Be useful for Jesus. Don't, don't be useless. Be useful. And then number three, this was important. Be ready. Be ready. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that I have. Be ready. The Bible says this is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience, even with the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Be ready for God to use you so that others can see Jesus changing and impacting your life. We had an incredible family in our church that, uh, had, had, had the great news that they were pregnant with twins. And in the middle of their pregnancy, uh, they got some devastating news that the, the lives of their babies were in danger. And in a moment, their entire life was turned upside down. And uh, we watched God work a miracle in their life. And we're watching God now begin to use their story and their experience to touch the lives of other people. And so today, I want to take a moment, and I want you just to turn your attention to the screen, and I want you to see their story about how God has just basically taken them and they're just real with the emotions that they felt and what they've gone through. But they're allowing God to use them. And at this moment of their life, they're ready to begin to share the story of what God's done. So take just a second and watch their story. When we found out we were pregnant with twins, we were excited and scared. I laughed. <laughs> and I cried. I had a feeling something wasn't right with the pregnancy, and at 19 weeks, um, we found out we had twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. The girls weren't sharing the placenta, which, you know, they weren't sharing blood flow or, or fluid levels. Um, it was very dangerous for their hearts and their brains. We immediately had to be rushed to Cincinnati, Ohio for surgery to save their life. So we packed up and left that night. I had to go to Cincinnati to get the surgery. I had to be done. I felt a lot of anger. I asked multiple times, like, why us? Why do we have to go through this? Why our girls? What did we do to deserve this? Um, we, the whole car ride to Cincinnati, we sat in silence. We didn't know what to say to each other. We didn't have the words. We were angry. We were upset. Um, I mean, to be honest, you know, why, why would something happen to our kids? You know, nobody wants anything to happen to their children. Um, I was hurt. It was really hard to handle. I remember feeling like I was sinking when the doctor actually said, you know, the words like, you've got stage three twin to twin transfusion. Um, it was scary. It, it was um, very dark, but um, I was afraid, very afraid. After we made it through the surgery and we thought everything was good and we were out of the woods, um, we were having my birthday dinner and my water broke. I was only 22 weeks, so we knew things were kind of up in the air. When we got to the hospital and were evaluated and everything was confirmed, the doctors were anything but encouraging. They basically told us that we had to make a decision if we wanted to fight for our kids 
and let them have no quality of life or if we were going to let them die peacefully in our arms. And that's a decision no parent should ever have to make. And I was angry. I remember um, just yelling, just so many different things, you know, pleading with God. Just so many emotions of, of so many different things. But at one point I heard God tell me, you know, I've never let you down before. I'm still with you. This is a hiccup. This is, this is for my glory. And it was almost like it wasn't easy, but it was peace. It was a form of peace. We made the decision to ultimately fight for our kids. Um, we knew in our heart that was the right thing to do. Um, God didn't give them to us without a reason, and we knew we had to fight for them. You know, science gave us no hope. Uh, medicine had no answers. Doctors didn't have any answers. It, you know, it was at that point that God stopped the labor. It was truly a miracle. Um, he let us last for five more weeks until the girls were actually born. The girls were born and it was the most beautiful day. They were one pound 12 ounces and two pound one ounce. And although they were extremely tiny, they were beautiful and they came out fighting. They were ready for the world. While we were in the NICU for 102 days, the girls had to overcome so much. They had to learn to breathe on their own, to eat, to gain weight, to keep their body temperature up. There were no words for just how tiny they really were. Um, they could have both probably fit in one of my hands. It was um, kind of a sigh of relief, but uh, definitely of, uh, we knew we still had a lot, a lot more to go through. Life with the girls today is great. Um, three girls is definitely not easy, two of which are infants, but I wouldn't have it any other way. They were 100% worth every single struggle that we went through. God definitely taught me in this season that hope is in Him, that medicine, science, doctors, while they're all, they all have their place, there's always a time that He is the only answer. Hold on and trust God through everything. He's got this. It's all part of his plan. And no matter how hard it gets, he won't leave you. He has got you in the palm of his hand. Isn't that awesome? Come on. God deserves all the credit. Chris plays drums at our Alabaster campus, and Anna's been uh, with the girls. She's been, in, uh, been able to come to church four times in the past year, uh, keeping those girls uh, just out of uh, contact with lots of people. But she said uh, this past week, and she said, we are on our way back. The girls are doing so good. And let me tell you, they're sharing their story, and it's making a difference in the lives of other people, showing the goodness of God of what he's done in them. There was good times. There was bad times. There was moments of trust. There was moments of, of untrust. There was moments of rest, and there was moments of of, uh, of unrest, but let me tell you, God's faithful, and your story is equally as important. You've got an audience of people that God has surrounded you with, and God so desperately wants us to become a walking billboard because we are the hope of the world to people, carrying the message of Jesus to those who are around us. Here's what I'm going to do today. I want to pray for us. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes where you are, and our band's going to come back. They're going to play just softly, and if you're our guest today, we don't do anything funny or weird. I just want to take a second and I want to pray for us. And I've got two things on my heart today that I, I want us to pray about. And I think today that if you're in this room, God has so purposely brought you here today just to speak to your heart and just encourage you. Because I feel like many of us walked in here and you know you've got a story to share. You've got something that God's given to you that can make a difference for others. And for whatever reason, you've been hesitant for your story. But today, here's what I want us to do. Number one, I want to say this. If you're in this room or watching by the internet and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, maybe you walked in here and you know who he is, but your relationship is just not personal. The number one thing you could do is give your heart and life to him. He is the one that makes the difference. It's not a church. It's not a logo. It's Jesus. Jesus is the hope. He is the answer. And I want to pray for you today. And if that's you... I encourage you to mark it on that Connect card. There's a place where you can just say, hey, today I'm giving my heart and my life to Jesus. And I encourage you to do that. So we can pray for you this week. We'll send you a letter to tell you how to take some next steps. We're not going to bother you. We want to open ourselves up to you and make ourselves available to help you learn and grow. 
And then for the rest of us, if you're in this room and today your heart was gripped, maybe just to be a, a bigger witness for God, not to keep it secret what he's done for you, but to post it all over your life in every aspect and every way. I want to pray that God would just encourage you today to do that. That we would take advantage of the season that's in front of us. It's one of the greatest opportunities we have. Because people are open to who Jesus is. Especially through this season. So today, Father, I just thank you. God, for your love and your grace. God, I thank you for the miracle of that, that family. And God, what you can do for that family, you can do for any one of us in this room. And so I pray for any one person that's here today that may not have a relationship with you, that today would be the day that life change would come. So, Father, we just ask you to forgive us of our sins, Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice you made so that we could be forgiven. We give you our heart and our life today. We commit ourselves to you, and we accept your grace today. And God, I pray for us all in this room to never forget the responsibility that we carry, and that's to be your hands and your feet and it's to share the life change that's taken place in us. So God, I pray that some of us are convicted today, that we walk out of this place feeling a responsibility for something we haven't been doing. And God, I pray for some of us, just for boldness, just to be able to share what you're doing because we want to be the exact replica of grace and love walking in the lives of others, caring and sharing our story, being ready to to share the reason for the hope that we have. And that's in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. We like to celebrate around here. Can we do it one more time? Come on. Can we celebrate Jesus today?